you're listening. Okay. <laughs> I'm failing at the first hurdle to work the technology properly. It's about headphones only. Anyway, listen, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, can I begin the proceedings and get us underway uh, this evening by welcoming all of you to Scotland, uh, welcoming all of you to my home city of Glasgow. It is a huge privilege and honour for us to be hosting the world here over this and next week. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome you to this discussion and to the official opening of this multi-level action pavilion. Uh, Scotland is hosting this pavilion in partnership with the International Organization of Local Governments for Sustainability. So over the course of the next two weeks, this pavilion will be hosting a range of different events, activities and discussions. And in doing that, it will be seeking to highlight two really important things. Firstly, to highlight the vitally important role that cities, states and devolved nations have in helping to tackle the climate crisis. There's no doubt at all that COP26 is not just the best chance, but probably the last chance that the world has to take the decisions that are capable of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And failure over the next two weeks should not be an option. The onus of responsibility, obviously, is first and foremost on the countries that will sit around the negotiating table and take these decisions. But there is a responsibility on the shoulders of all of us. Governments like Scotland's might not be at that negotiating table, but we still have a vital role. Around about half of all of the reduction in emissions that is required to meet 1.5 degrees depend on actions taken by governments like ours. So our responsibility is enormous and we must face up to it. So this pavilion will host a range of discussions that help focus our minds on how to do that. But the second purpose of the pavilion is to highlight the work that Scotland specifically is doing to seek to lead by example. Now I should say, first of all, Scotland, like every country, needs to do more. We're not yet doing everything we could do or should be doing. So we have a responsibility to increase our ambition too. But we have targets for reducing emissions that are not just the most ambitious or amongst the most ambitious in the world, but amongst the, the toughest. Not just aiming to reach net zero by 2045, but putting a big near-term responsibility on our shoulders of reducing by 2030 emissions by 75%. Is that a tough thing to do? Absolutely. But it is incumbent on every government to stretch their ambition, to do as much as possible, as fast as possible. So we will discuss here over the next two weeks the range of activities that Scotland is engaged in. And of course, as part of that is the role that industry is playing in helping us to decarbonise. And playing a leading role, I'm glad to say, is one of uh, Scotland's leading industries, the whisky industry. Can I say in passing how pleasing it is for me to be part of an all-women panel uh, today as well, which <laughs> highlights, I think, the importance of putting women's voices more at the heart of this debate. The whisky industry is hugely important to Scotland, uh, important to Scotland economically, but important too in the sense of Scotland's brand and international reputation. And it has a good track record of ambitious sustainability targets and of delivery. It is a partner in the United Nations Race to Zero campaign and its sustainability strategy commits it to net zero by 2040, five years ahead of Scotland's target date to reach net zero. So the whisky industry is a shining example for Scotland in so many ways, but not least in the action that has been taken to tackle climate change. So let me end by again welcoming you all here. I hope you enjoy your time in Glasgow and in Scotland. I hope you get to see some of this, in my completely unbiased opinion, the best city anywhere in the world. Uh, if not always the warmest or the driest. Uh, but more than anything, I hope what happens within this summit site over the next few weeks positions Glasgow, just as it was the city 
to help lead the world into the industrial age, positions Glasgow as the place the world took a decisive step forward towards the net zero age. All of us owe that to the generations that come after us. So thank you very much for being here this evening. Enjoy everything Glasgow has to offer. Okay, we have uh, the First Minister for another five minutes. My name is Becky Paskin. I'm uh, a whiskey journalist and presenter, um, fortunately based down in England, not up in Scotland. Um, but we're here to talk about the shining example that Scotch whiskey is setting for the entire world when it comes to environmental strategies and sustainability as well. So as the First Minister just mentioned, uh, whiskey is one of the most energy compliant sectors in Scotland, in fact, even in the world as well. And it's a huge growth driver for the British and Scottish economies. So we're here to discuss everything to do with Scotch and sustainability. I'm thrilled to be joined by Karen Betts, the CEO of the Scotch Whiskey Association, and Annabelle Thomas, the founder of Nicknean Distillery as well. My first question to you, Karen. So one of the things we just uh, heard is that the Scotch Whiskey Association has committed to reducing further carbon emissions and having a net zero approach to climate by uh, 2040. Can you tell us a bit more about the sustainability strategy and what's brought you to this point so far? Thanks very much, Becky. Uh, and yes, it's a privilege to be here on an all-female panel. Uh, really great. Um, so to answer your question, Becky, the, the Scotch whisky industry has been working on sustainability and environmental issues for getting on for 20 years now. Uh, we, um, we make Scotch whisky in some of the most beautiful landscapes in Scotland, and it is made entirely from natural ingredients. So that's water, barley, yeast, men, women and time is what creates Scotch whisky. So we have been very conscious for some time that we needed to act to conserve the environment in which, we were, which we're based, to preserve Scotch whisky's future, but also to ensure that we were properly preserving uh, the landscape for the communities within which we are based into the future. Um, the other reason I think why we have been so, mot so motivated to act is because the industry is scattered across the four corners of Scotland. And to that extent, we kind of knew that sustainability solutions were not going to come to us, that we would have to go out and find them. So again, that has driven a lot of the investment that we have made uh, in renewables. And finally, I think, and you know, one of the things that is very clear at COP today is you know, consumers care about this now. Investors care, activists care, regulators care. So to be a responsible industry, we have to, you know, we have to play our part. So yes, we have, uh, our, our, we have set a new sustainability strategy with four big goals. The first is that we will meet uh, net zero by 2040. So we are heavily investing both in renewables and in en energy efficiency in order to be able to get there. We have really researched our pathway. We know the sort of next four to five years of our pathway, but we don't know what will come beyond that. But it will be a mix of things that include hydrogen, biomass, anaerobic digestion, geothermal, uh, wind and electrification. We've also made commitments about our water use to bring all of our water use within a responsible level by 2025 and to play our role as responsible stewards for Scotland's water. Uh, we are also changing the way that we use our land to make sure that we are conserving that. So we are working with farmers on the production of barley and making that net zero. We are working on peatland restoration across, uh, across the highlands and islands of Scotland. Uh, and finally, we are changing the way we bottle and package Scotch whisky. Uh, and our commitment is all that, our, that all of our packaging will be recyclable, reusable or compostable by 2025. So some stretching and ambitious targets, but we're confident that we can meet them. Those are some really bold and very ambitious targets. And I'm delighted to hear that the Scotch whisky industry is committing to achieving those. Uh, for you, First Minister, why is achieving net zero so important for Scotland? And what is it exactly you're hoping to achieve here at COP26? 
Well, every country has an obligation to reach net zero by the middle of the century, 2050. And countries that can get there more quickly have an obligation to do it. The Committee on Climate Change has assessed that all things going the way we want them to, Scotland has the ability to achieve that by 2045. And we have to do it for our own sake, for the sake of our own populations and communities, but also to show the leadership that drives the rest of the world. And, and that really is the inescapable responsibility we have. What we hope to achieve at uh, COP26 is to play our part, however big or small that might be, in trying to drive the world in the right direction. Uh, you know, I sat through the opening ceremony earlier on and, you know, I, I defy anybody to sit and listen to the power of those presentations and come away with anything other than a renewed determination. You know, we're the generation that has no excuse. We know what will happen to the planet if we allow global warming to stay on the path it's on. But we also know what we need to do to stop that. So we can't be the generation that effectively sits back and allows the planet to die. That would be unconscionable. So all of us, big countries, small countries, have got a part to play in making sure that doesn't happen. And we've all got that responsibility. And speaking of generations, obviously Scotch whiskey has been an industry that's been around for hundreds of years. There are distilleries that are over 200 years old within Scotland, but part of the next generation of distillers making whiskey is Nick Nian. So Annabelle Thomas, you founded Nick Nian, and from the start, your goal was to be a net zero distillery. Can you tell us a bit about what that means, what you set out to achieve and what exactly you're doing at Nick Nian? Thanks, Becky. So, yeah, at Nicknean, it for me, business as usual, when we were setting Nicknean up, which was only eight years ago, which is small fry in the history of Scotch, um, sustainability is, is key. You, business as usual is not an option anymore. And we wanted that to be at the heart of the business from the very beginning. The key, we've, we've said, Scotch is a very energy intensive process. Those beautiful copper stills take a lot of energy to heat up. And that was really our focus. We chose biomass, which is one of the energies that um, Karen mentioned. We chose it because we're in a very remote place and we have biomass on site. It made sense for us. It's not the right answer for everybody. But we've also tried to look at everything else that we do as well. So we have a closed loop water system. We are recycling all of our waste to the land. Um, we, uh, packaging, also Karen mentioned, is critical. It's in our supply chain, but you know we have control over it. We use 100% recycled glass for our bottles, which was the first in the Scotch industry. And finally, we source organic barley. And I think as, a, as an industry that buys a lot of barley, in particular a lot of barley in Scotland, we have a great responsibility to try and work with the farming industry towards as sustainable, regenerative, um, process as possible. Thanks. Oh, we're just swapping out now. So thank you very much, First Minister, for, for, for coming off. Nice, nice to have you. Um, can I please welcome to stage Mari McCallan, who is the Minister for Environment and Land Reform. Thanks for joining us, Mari. Um, so as Annabelle just mentioned, uh, I think those, those initiatives that look at uh, using things like recycled glass to make bottles and uh, sustainable packaging doesn't necessarily mean that you're looking at an inferior product. In fact, Nick Nian's bottles are some of the most beautiful in the industry that you can find right now. Um, and if anyone is sticking around until the end of this panel discussion, there'll be some lovely Nick Nian uh, cocktails coming out too. So stick around and enjoy some of them. Uh, as the First Minister alluded to um, in her speech, she mentioned that this is an all-female panel. It's quite an anomaly, actually, within the whiskey industry, which is very male-dominated, to have four women on a stage talking about whiskey. Um, it's something that I know all of us are striving towards, is greater diversity and inclusion within the Scotch industry. But my question to you, Karen, how can the sector improve women's leadership, particularly in the industry? And why is diversity and inclusion so important? Thanks very much, Becky. Um, I think diversity and inclusion is really important to the industry. We launched uh, an industry-wide diversity and inclusion charter uh, last year. So it's been going for just over a year now. And that was really rec in recognition of how seriously the industry takes issues of 
diversity and inclusion to make sure fundamentally, I think, that there are equal opportunities in the industry, that whatever your diversity, there is a place for you to succeed and thrive in our industry, whether that's about ethnicity or religion or disability, visible or invisible, whether it's about fairness for the LGBTQ plus community, all of those things we, we want to make sure are right in the industry. And we were also conscious, as, as you have alluded to, that we are, we are a traditional manufacturing industry. And to that extent, uh, we have seemed male dominated in the past. I think that is really changing. And I think that the four of us are on the panel today is, you know, is part of that change and evolution. But you know, it's a bit like sustainability. We are on a journey with diversity and inclusion and we still have challenges ahead and we still have uh, we still have a way to go, but you know the, the companies, the member companies of the Scotch Whiskey Association, vast majority of the industry do take it really seriously and do really want, uh, really want that change and that support for people. Uh, you know, whoever you are, come and work with us. Come and uh, come and have a successful career. Come and thrive in the industry. Uh, whiskey is for everyone. Very well said. And I, I think this uh, evolution of making this industry more accessible to the next generation and leaving uh, the planet in a better state uh, for the next generation also plays into the idea of diversity and inclusion. Let's make this industry, the Scotch whisky industry, more inclusive and welcoming so the next generation have careers that they can look forward to. And uh, in particular, I know Annabelle's been doing a lot of work in this area with Nick Nian with encouraging women to come in and and take on work experience placements to encourage more women to think of distilling in whiskey as a career path. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in that area? Absolutely. So it, this, this is not something that I came into the industry with a mission to change, actually. It's something that evolved because a lot of people looked at me and said, but do you even like whiskey? <laughs> And they would have never asked that of a man. So it's become a kind of thing that I've become involved in. And I think um, we're really trying to do two things. One is on a from a work point of view encouraging people in we have an internship where people can come and try out working in a whiskey distillery and they see all aspects of the company for a couple of weeks and that impacts those people but hopefully it gives a broader message that actually this is a place for women to thrive and have fantastic careers and the other thing we're trying to do in our external messaging in you know what you see on instagram what you see on our website making sure that we show a very diverse group of consumers consuming our whiskey and demonstrate that the industry is actually a very open place with you know, plenty of different people in it. And I think that's the way that we'll make progress. Can I add something to bring in you, Minister? Um, so, you know, one of the things that Annabelle has alluded to is it's quite often uh, hard in uh, in some of the parts of Scotland where we run sites to, you know, to persuade uh, young girls and young women that the whisky industry offers them really brilliant careers and really brilliant careers that can stand them in good stead for the rest of their lives. They can work in Scotland, they could work overseas. So part of the challenge I also think we need to overcome is, is much better part partnering with the with the schools and the education system so that, that so that young people understand the careers that are available to them from an early age and don't take decisions that kind of would count them out uh, of a of a career in the whiskey industry before they've got to got to that stage no, thank, thank you thanks karen no i quite agree and i think that the um the areas that you're talking about are rural areas um, and you know as a rural MSP and as a young woman in politics I can quite understand how those issues don't always um, conflate but I think there is probably nothing more inspiring to young women potentially looking to get into the industry than seeing leaders like you um, and you and I Karen have met on a number of occasions uh, and I've always been so impressed by how forward looking you are and uh, particularly in some of the peatlands work that, that we were doing. But just on the wider point about young people and skills, I really hope that COP26 being in Scotland and the legacy of that can be really centrally about skills and about careers for young people. I hope that this excites them. I hope that it encourages them to find their path in a sustainable career, which of course could be in the whiskey industry. Just, just to back to you actually, Mary, because that's a really lovely point about 
seeing other female leaders, maybe within your industry, your own industry or, or elsewhere, and being inspired by them to take a career, uh, maybe whether it's in politics or either in whiskey, how important is strong female leadership for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very important indeed. In fact, I've been reflecting being at COP26 that as a, as a young woman, as a young politician, I, it takes having a leader like the First Minister who we've just heard from to believe that young people deserve to be heard, young women deserve to be heard, to her, for her to appoint someone of my age and stage in this role. And I, I just feel very fortunate that in Scotland we do have uh, the First Minister and she's certainly a, an inspiration to me. And as I say, for young women looking at people on this panel, that will be deeply inspiring to them as well, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, taking this back to uh, climate change and obviously the sustainability strategy that Karen was speaking about. Obviously, there are 134 Scotch whisky distilleries in Scotland now. I'm glad I got that number right because it's changing all of the time and I can never keep up. But what can you just highlight some of the ways that Scotch whisky distilleries are really working to lower their carbon emissions and also their footprint on uh, the environment? Thanks. I mean, we've got a number of, uh, of projects going on now and, you know, they range from uh, large companies investing, for instance, in anaerobic digestion, which is not only creating the fuel for their distilleries, but it in fact is creating some of the fuel for, uh, for their lorries that do the distribution. Uh, we've got companies that sh are using entirely sustainable uh, heat sources, so like Annabelle's distillery, they're using biomass uh, or they're using um, water power hydroelectric. Uh, we've got some, uh, some distilleries using, uh, we've got some very innovative projects around cleaning wastewater. So one of our companies has re-established an oyster bed in the Dornoch Firth to clean some of the uh, some of the industry, some of their distilleries wastewater, which not only is a plus uh, for the for the wastewater that they're dealing with, but it's actually a huge plus for the Dornoch Firth where the, the oyster beds were, were removed about 100, more than 100 years ago, I think. So I think you've got lots of different distilleries doing a variety of different things. I mean, one of the things that's really clear and Annabelle referred to it is many distilleries are quite you know quite remote and so you do need a sort of suite of options you need a variety of different solutions you know there is no one size fits all solution so in fact we have a, a distillery uh, um, up in Orkney that is starting to use high energy heat pumps so that you know that's a really interesting project that we're following closely to see if that technology could be adopted by somebody else, but yes, it sort of depends where you are and what your site is like, how old your site is. Um, but yes, it's a variety uh, of, of different solutions and you know, real innovation and local solutions. I think one of the, obviously one of the aims of COP26 is collaboration. So working together as different governments, different countries, different sectors, learning from one another, learning from all the innovations that are happening from around Scotland, so learning from competitors. Annabelle, a question for you, how important for you as one of these rural distilleries, how important for you is this idea of collaboration and achieving net zero? I think it's really important and I think the whiskey industry is fantastic at collaboration and that's a long history that we've always had and I think sharing, sharing ideas, sharing progress, sharing, you know, the, the things that don't work as well is really important. And sustainability, as Karen said, is a journey. It's a journey for every business, it's a journey for everybody personally, and it's a journey for the industry. And I think there's, it, it's a pretty hard nut to crack. So I think the only way we're going to do it is together. Speaking again of together, you are one of the only distilleries, it's not the only distillery in Scotland, that uh, reveals your annual carbon footprint. How important do you think it is for companies to be doing that? And would you encourage others to pick that up and do the same? It is absolutely critical that every company man measures their carbon footprint. If you don't measure it, you don't know where to focus. And um, in something like Scotch, there are some obvious things that you don't need to measure to know where to look, the energy to run the stills. But otherwise, if you don't know what your carbon footprint is, you can't work on the biggest areas to reduce it. So measuring it is critical. I think that's for every company in the world. It's not a Scotch thing. 
Um, I would like to see more people publishing it because I think that's important for the consumer. I think transparency for modern consumers is critical. And so we do publish it and we say what we're not doing well as well as we say what we're doing well. And I would like to see every company, not just a Scotch thing, moving in that direction. I think then that obviously gives consumers a very transparent idea of exactly what companies are doing to lower their carbon emissions. Um, at this point, we're going to see if, it, if anybody has any questions for our panel at all, for Annabelle, Karen, or Murray. But if Can I just come in? Yeah. Could I come in on that final transparency point? So today, the Scotch Whiskey Association released figures on behalf of the industry uh, that confirm that uh, since 2008, we have cut our carbon emissions by uh, by 53%. Uh, and we have improved our energy efficiency. And those two things obviously go together by 13%. And to Annabelle's point, we are very transparent about all the work that we are doing on reaching net zero and also improving our environmental impact. All that information is available on our website. And you know, to Annabelle's point, uh, companies will make assertions uh, about uh, how close they are to net zero. You can only really trust those, uh, those assertions if you can follow the data. And I think one of the things that is really interesting about the Scotch whiskey industry is you absolutely can follow that data, we are very transparent about it. So if you want to know uh, how um, how close to, to net zero your favorite dram is, if you want to know what other environmental projects the industry is doing, look on the Scotch Whiskey Association's website, look on the website of, of your favorite whiskey and the information will be there. Just to add as well, if after this you're feeling quite thirsty, there are a number of pubs around Glasgow which are offering some fantastic whiskies, and I'm sure you'll be able to find the Gnin and all of them as well. So go and have a look around. Um, I'm just going to wrap up now by saying thank you so much to our panel for Mari, to Karen and Annabelle, and of course the First Minister who had to dash off. Please give them a round of applause. I think. To summarise, we can come away from this discussion with the understanding that the key to achieving net zero, to lowering our carbon emissions, to leaving the planet in a better state than we've been given it, is to collaborate together, to work together. Uh, only by working as a team can we actually achieve those goals and to give the next generation a chance, not just in the Scotch whisky industry, but in life as well. Uh, so thanks everyone for Yes. Thanks, everyone, for joining. That was Annabelle telling me, can you ask them to stay around for drinks? Because we've got lots of whiskey <laughs> that's been poured. Yeah, round of applause for the cocktails. <laughs> um, we're about to have our reception tea, and it will be opened by Gino Van Vegan, who is the Secretary General of ICLE. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's an honor for me to be here. My name is Gino van Begin. I'm the Secretary General of ICLE. ICLE is a local government network that helps throughout the world, local and regional governments to achieve more sustainability in their jurisdictions. And we are here today at this multi-level action pavilion because this is the home for cities, towns, and sub-national states um, in the blue zone here at COP26. And the reason why we are here is because we have an interest, an invested interest, to influence the negotiations on the second phase of the Paris Agreement implementation. We think that parties must collaborate with other levels of government, be it at the city level, at a municipal level, at regional level or sub-national level. Keeping us on a path towards 1.5 will never be achieved by the parties alone. We need the industry, we need the private sector, we need the academia, and above all, we need local and regional governments. We have started this process of influencing advocating for local and regional governments since 2008. And since then, we have each year been able to set up a home for cities and towns and regions at these COPs. And here I would like to thank very, very much the Scottish government, um, the first uh, minister, 
and in particular the entire team um, here at the Scottish Government for the relentless work um, of bringing this pavilion together. It has been a particular difficult situation because of the pandemic uh, conditions under which we all have to work. But I think that it is great to see that today we are here together, um, although in limited numbers, again, due to the pandemic, but we are also virtual. So everything that we do here for the next uh, 10 days or two weeks is being transmitted worldwide. And already here, when we opened the session, there were three governors, eight mayors already just for today. And this will continue. So we will be and talking also to local and regional leaders from around the world as well, who um, are watching us here and working with us towards um, our other partners here at the um, um, in the blue zone and in particular the parties. So we have set up together with the Scottish government and with their generous support, a full program of two weeks of sessions. And I invite you all to um, um, remain with us also in these two weeks. But for now, I would like to um, open this pavilion um, officially. Thank you very much for the um, sector, in particular, whiskey sector, for being with us at this um, official opening. Thank you again to the First Minister and the entire team of the Scottish Government. Thank you so much.